Hi, Shalom friends. You know, the mind is a wonderful thing because the mind can take and observe and come to conclusions which seem to be radically different from one to, a, to another. In other words, two people seeing and examining the same uh, set of facts might come up and interpret in a manner where they're both opposites. You all heard of the, the, the optimist and the pessimist. I want to share with you just maybe uh, both an observation and, and a perspective about today's day and age. If you've been listening to the news, uh, you've been exposed to some pretty horrible stuff. And it's not only today and yesterday, but it's been, it's been uh, growing in a sense. So what I'm referring to, let me share with you a couple. Number one, we're being exposed to um, a threat that comes from the Arab world. I'm not only referring to terrorism, which is wanton murder, but the word cruelty. Cruelty is, is something which is not really that much in our 21st century um, world. I mean, there is crime, but cruelty is it seems something barbaric, something something like a throwback to the past. And we've all been uh, privileged or not privileged to hear and see about people being burnt alive, heads being cut off, hands being cut off, and we're being told about punishments that since the Middle Ages haven't been meted out. And that's one thing I ask myself, why are we being exposed to this type of, of information? And this, why are we being exposed to this type of cruelty in, a, in, a, in today's day and age of so-called sophistication and decency? Another thing that's constantly in the news, and that's of course our beloved land of Israel, and the idea of a boycott. Now this has been developing for a while, but just actually last week, 700 uh, artists in uh, the UK signed a, an, a paper saying they will not perform, uh, they will not um, go visit, they don't even want their works of poetry or artistry to be exhibited in Israel and so on. And this is in addition to the academic boycott where many, many universities are refusing to allow uh, Israeli professors to come and, and teach and, and to develop thesis. And you say to yourself, like, why is this happening? And I could go on and on, but I don't want to depress you. So now let me tell you, let me put a spin on this. The Rebbe once uh, said that you could put a spin on any on anything. And he said, wryly, he said, a person could spit you in the face. And then you could say, I think it's raining. <laughs> I think it's raining a blessing. But I'm not going to go that far. I'm merely going to point out some ideas which you might or might not uh, agree with, but I think it's worthy of you considering. M Everything that happens in this world not only happens for a reason, but to a great extent is for the purpose of the Jewish people to learn. In other words, all of the headlines, in addition to it being a lesson to mankind and God's plan is unfolding, in particular, it is a message to the Jewish people. So let's start with cruelty. The Jewish people have been fighting wars in the land of Israel and gone to the extreme of trying to be as gentle. I know it sounds weird. You can't fight a war and be gentle. But try to be as, as respectful of human life and of civilians, of civilian innocence, not to hurt them. Not, not that they should be what they call in English collateral damage. And yet, the, the press and world opinion has said the, the most heinous things about the IDF and about the people of Israel, have likened them, God forbid, to Nazis, 
and said how they're so uncaring and unfeeling and literally cruel. They're just killing innocents, maiming and harming and wounding, and look what they're doing to the poor people of Gaza, etc., etc. Unfortunately, swept up with this craziness and with this open lie have been many, many good-natured Jews who have Jewish hearts but read the newspapers and are heavily influenced by the media, see the images, which are, by the way, are very slanted, and they too shout loudly, Oi, oi, how could this be? Our brothers and sisters in Israel being so cruel. So perhaps, and only perhaps, Hashem wants to remind the Jewish people, as well as the world, you, you accuse the, the finest people on earth, the most ethical and moral people on earth of cruelty? Let me show you what true cruelty is. And hence, the headlines. When you begin to realize how the Israeli army is protecting men, women, and children from, from harm, and are doing it in a way which is unheard of to try to take care of them, to try to, to take, to, to even the enemy to treat with a certain amount of, of decency and indeed respect. And then you see what's happening today. You begin to realize what is cruelty. Cruelty is barbarism. It's wanton and it's one-sided. Another thing to consider, and again, I'm talking about a lesson to the Jewish people. The very people that are advocating this cruelty, when you see pictures of them, and I say this uh, as, as a rabbi with a beard, I look at these people with beards, dressed modestly in these long robes, wearing some type of a kaftan, almost like a hat, and I say, you know, th they could look like rabbis. And I've heard for years people tell me, you know, the rabbis are so strict. They're always trying to make life more difficult for, for the people. Oh, the, the rabbis forbid this and the rabbis forbid that. And I say, you know nothing about Jewish law. Actually, the rabbis are constantly trying to help Jewish people live a, a life of godliness in the most in the most comfortable way possible. So, no, it's not true. This, the rabbis are always forbidding things. And I say this maybe with tongue in cheek. You want to know what people that look like rabbis are doing? You will see them forbidding everything. Cell phones, music, joy. You will see them oppressing, belittling human beings and their own women are treated horribly. And not at all to even contrast, merely to point out, if you look at rabbinic laws, you will see the constant desire of the rabbis to try to help people serve Hashem to the extent that even when it's biblically forbidden and the Bible prescribes a punishment, the great rabbis of old said, if we were to be on that court, we would make sure that no one was punished. As if to say, there's the Torah that puts down the law and educates the Jewish people about how severe a transgression is. And then the great rabbis of Israel try everything possible to bring compassion and to find a reason to mitigate judgment against them. The direct opposite the, they might look superficially the same, but there are those that advocate the law of, of Islam and advocate it in a way of true cruelty, true disrespect towards a human being. You can't even compare that to the way the rabbis loved, revered not only the Jew, but all of mankind. There's another thing to consider. Just very recently, 
Should the Jews of Europe leave? The Prime Minister of Israel makes these public announcements, proclamations come to Israel. And then, I don't know if it ever happened before, where we have heads of state, France and Germany, pleading with the Jews, don't leave. We want you to be in our country. We love the Jewish people. We need you in our country. If you leave, we can't be France. Germany cannot be Germany. We need Jewish people. Now, I'm not going to wade into the fray whether or not they should leave. I'm just trying to listen to an interesting message. And the, again, I am dealing with a Jewish perspective. Unfortunately and sadly, for so many years, Jewish people have said that the source of anti-Semitism is being Jewish. So let's just merge. Let's just assimilate. Let's just disappear. Let's not say we're Jewish and then the, our neighbors and the non-Jews will love us. And here, it's amazing. I hear non-Jews saying to the Jewish people, please remain Jewish. Remain Jews. And not only is that a blessing for you, it's a blessing for us. Do, do you not hear perhaps a messianic ring to this? Where non-Jews are, are pleading with Jews not assimilate or not even go away. We don't want to be in the presence of a Jew. They're saying just the opposite. Stay and through you we will be blessed. Another thing, in the days of the Mashiach, evil will be fought. Actually, evil will be destroyed. And we often think to ourselves, you know, that's, that, that's going to be a very hard thing to do. I mean, if the Jewish people are going to be the instrument, how could 15, 18 million Jews get rid of evil worldwide? And I'm fascinated by the fact, not that evil exists, but that Arab states, Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, so many of the Arab states are trying to fight a form of evil in, in the form of ISIS. Or to put it a little bit differently, and this is again with a touch of irony, when Jewish people say, let us make peace with our Arab neighbors, we are confronted where Arab neighbors cannot make peace with one another. As a matter of fact, each time they look and they see a group which they consider to be, whether it be evil or on the wrong side of the political party, they go out and they do terrible things to them. Let me concentrate on the positive. The war to destroy terrorism, the war to destroy, um, I use the word evil often, but I'll say it again, to destroy evil is being fought not only through Jewish people. There's a world that's slowly awakening that evil should be destroyed. You know, let me end with a story joke. It has been said that there were once two Jews that were shipwrecked. They come to this island, they have nothing. So it's Yankel and Beryl. And as we all know, two Jews is three opinions. And they say to each other, you know what? We have to pray. We have to pray for a miracle. But Yankel says to, Ber to Beryl, you know what, if we pray for a miracle and it happens, how will we know why God made the miracle? How will we know if God made the miracle for Beryl or for Yankel? You know what, why do we not go to each, go to a part of the island? So Beryl leaves Yankel, he goes to one side, Yankel stays on the other side, and that day, Beryl prays, please, Almighty God, I'm hungry. I trust you completely. Please give me food. Beryl goes to bed. The next morning, he finds food with a grateful look towards heaven. Thank you, God, for having heard my prayer. 
he prays another prayer prayer god please uh, provide me with clothing he goes to bed he wakes up there's clothing the next day he's grateful to god and he says god you're listening to all of my prayers i am so grateful send a boat and sure enough on the third day a boat comes the third boat comes the third day the boat comes beryl remembers yankel and he says to the captain hold on and he runs to the other side and yankel is there hungry wearing tatters and beryl says to yankel, come come god made a miracle he answered all of my prayers uh, there is a boat ready to take us and as yankel goes with beryl slowly towards the boat beryl says to yankel you see I told you God would make a miracle, and it's very clear God made a miracle for me. I'm the one that was worthy. Yanka looks at him in surprise. How do you know God answered you? He says, what do you mean? Take a look. I'm the one that had the food. I'm the one that had the clothing, and I'm the one that has the boat. He said, you know what I was praying for? I prayed to God that he should listen to your prayers. Friends, we've been praying for 2,000 years that a world recognize the importance and the need for Jewish people. We've been praying for thousands of years for a time where evil will be despised and cruelty will be destroyed. I see much of these prayers being answered through others. And that's why I want to end off with a bit of a challenge as well to my listeners. I truly do not believe that the boycott against Israel in terms of academia or art is actually bad for us at all. I hear it as the non-Jew saying to the Jew, you're so wise. You're so powerful. Why are you satisfying your potential by sending us plays and art? Send us Torah. Send us moral clarity. It is true we are indebted to you for your medicine and for your technology and for your brilliant professors, but you're capable of more. The one boycott that they will never do is out of Zion shall come forth Torah. Out of Jerusalem will come clarity of thought. Out of the holy land of Israel will come holiness. That will, there can never be a boycott. They could tell us that we should not be satisfied by sending them oranges or flowers. What they're really trying to tell us is, send us teachers, send us holiness. That day, my friends, is coming very, very quickly. So for one, I am very optimistic, I am very hopeful, and I'm joyful. We are living in the footsteps of the Mashiach, and let's hope and pray that the body emerges and the day arises. Shalom. Shalom.